Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us in this uh, um, seminar for the uh, Eurocam. Eurocam is the European Renal and Cardiovascular Medicine Working Group from the uh, European Renal Association. Um, um, our aim is to promote the collaboration of among European uh, research uh, to, to try to understand this area of cardiovascular and renal uh, diseases. So we have today a um, seminar which is uh, going to be, uh, our speaker is going to be Dr. Charles Ferro. Uh, Dr. Ferro is a consultant nephrologist in the University Hospital in Birmingham. And we have also our panelist uh, Olga Balafa from the Nephrology uh, University Hospital in Ioannia. Ioannia. Uh, I'm myself, uh, Jose Manuel Valdivieso from the uh, Vascular and Renal uh, Research Group in the Biomedical Institute for Research in Lleida and the University Hospital of, of Arnaud Villanova. Lucia Del Vecchio. Lucia Del Vecchio is a nephrologist in the Santa Ana Hospital in Como, Italy. And uh, well, I guess that now, Charlie, if you want to start, we will listen to you. Okay, thank you, Jose, for that lovely introduction. Um, so today I've been asked to talk about echocardiography or cardiac magnetic resonance imaging or cardiac assessment in CKD patients. And it's one of those talks that seemed like a very good idea when we first proposed it two or three years ago. But I'm not sure how it's going to go to date. So these are my disclosures. None of them are particularly relevant for this presentation. But to, to help me sort of focus this talk, if I can start off with asking the audience a couple of questions. So the first one is, how many people here currently have easy access to one, echocardiography, two, cardiac magnetic resonance imaging, three, both, or four, neither? I think you get a, the option to vote now. Right, so echocardiography, nobody has access to cardiac magnetic resonance imaging. Oh, wow, okay, I wasn't expecting that one. I thought some people might, um, oh, but some people have both. 11 out of 45 have access to both. That's my fault for not asking the question properly, and neither. Okay, so I'll move on to the next question then. How many people here actually regularly use cardiac magnetic resonance imaging for cardiac assessment in patients for CKD and stage kidney disease for one, clinical, two, research, three, both clinical and research, or four, neither. And again, if you vote now, I'll give a few seconds. So it should be 11 out of 45, I think. But neither, most like in the previous answer, but it seems like in clinical research and for both. So there's, a, there's quite a bit of a spread there, but clearly it's, it's being used. Um, and that's our experience of being used more and more in the UK. Um, not so much in America, but the, the, it's coming a bit closer. Okay, so that'll help me, that helps me quite a lot. Thank you for answering that. The, the cunning plan for the next 20 or so minutes is I'm going to talk a bit about echocardiography and cardiac magnetic resonance imaging, talking about the generic advantages and disadvantages. Then I'm going to come back down to a bit more basics as to why is cardiac imaging important in CKD and stage kidney disease. And that unfortunately goes back to talking about morbidity and mortality, which will bring us on to uremic or CKD associated cardiomyopathy and the three main factors, mass, function, and fibrosis. If we have time, we'll probably skirt through other issues like valves, ischemia testing, and aortic stiffness. But at the end, I'd quite like to share with you a case that we've been working on quite recently, which I think hopefully might help bring together a lot of points we're going to discuss. So let's see how we get on. So what is echocardiography and cardiac magnetic resonance imaging? Well, echocardiography is basically sound waves. And so high frequency sound waves are emitted by a probe. They bounce off different tissues of different densities. And they, when they bounce back, they're picked up by receiver. And you can watch the, the pictures, images on a monitor. And these are, what I'm showing you now, is fairly good quality echocardiography. And it's much better than the last 10, 20 years. And you can get quite detailed pictures. And for clinical purposes, is often all we need. 
One of the main advantages with echocardiography is that you get to see blood flowing and you can measure blood using Doppler and it's why echocardiography remains the modality of choice still for assessing valves and flow through valves. Cardiac magnetic resonance imaging, and so before anybody objects, that's not a patient, that's one of my research fellows' heart. Um, all my research fellows have got a heart. I wish I could scan their brains to see if they actually had a brain half the time, but they definitely all have hearts that we've scanned. And that's Luke at the bottom. So cardiomagnetic resonance images basically uses high power, very powerful ma magnets with high frequency radio waves to change the, um, the axis of spin of molecules within the body. In particular, we're interested in proton molecules. A quick, um, run through the, the pros and the cons. So echocardiography is cheap. In the UK at the moment, we are allowed to charge the National Health Service 59 pounds, which is about 64 euros at yesterday's exchange rate. Cardiomagnetic resonance image, on the other hand, is quite expensive. The list price is about 403 pounds, which is 459 euros, roughly. So much more expensive, takes a lot longer. Echocardiography, as we've seen, from the, the quick poll we did, it's very accessible to most people, whereas CMR is, remains relatively inaccessible, certainly in the UK and probably throughout most of Europe. Neither modality uses radiation, which is a good thing. Echocardiography does rely on good acoustic windows, so it doesn't work particularly well in people who, with very high uh, fat um, body mass index or in women with large breasts. Cardiomagnetic resonance imaging isn't affected by body shape to a large extent. Echocardiography doesn't have a weight limit, as long as you can, they can sit in a chair or even stand. CMR is limited by a weight, and our scanner can only take 120 kilograms, nothing more than that, into the scanner. Echocardiography is not enclosed, whereas people with claustrophobia or who don't like being in closed spaces often struggle with CMR. Echocardiography, because it can measure blood flow very well and easily, is excellent for valvular assessment, whereas the CMR is mainly for characterizing the myocardium. And that's roughly the pros and cons of this. In my simple mind, CMR gives you very high detailed resolution imaging, which you can digitalize and analyze in lots of different ways. Whereas echocardiography, despite the advances, still produces grainy, fuzzy images that rely in some ways on subjective interpretation. Again, putting it simply to me, CMR is like watching high definition television. Echocardiography is like watching an echo, a, a program in the 1950s on a cathode ray tube television. So we move on to cardiovascular diseases. This is a slide that most of you would have seen millions of times, particularly when you come to Eurocan congresses uh, quite often. So on the left is a slide that actually probably one of the main reasons I became a nephrologist rather than a cardiologist was by Rob Foley. And if you see on the left in the red dots, it effectively means that a young man aged 30 on dialysis has a same chance of having a cardiovascular death in the subsequent year as an 85 year old man or woman walking around the streets with normal kidney function. And that to me was quite a horrifying statistic. It took another 14 years or so for um, Alan Go using the Kaiser Permanente database in Northern California to once again show that it's not just the dialysis patients that increase risk, but actually people with lower GFRs below 60 start having a big increase in cardiovascular mortality. And certainly by the time you get to CKD stage 3B with EGFRs less than 45, the mortality starts to go up exponentially. But what do we actually mean? by cardiovascular mortality. Well, increasing data shows that these patients are not actually dying from traditional cardiovascular disease, not vascular occlusive atheromatous cardiovascular disease. But most of them are dying arrhythmias from arrhythmias and cardiac arrest and from heart failure. And although this is quite clear in dialysis patients, the, it increases in prevalence from as the GFR goes down. So the lower the GFR, the less proportion of people that actually die from vascular occlusive disease and the increasing proportion that die from arrhythmias and heart failures. So uremic cardiomyopathy, or as I prefer to call it, and there's increasing movement to call it, CKD-associated cardiomyopathy, 
This has been known since about 1975, and this is the earliest reference I can find to this. So a paper by Prosser and Parsons back in 1975, where they called it uremic myocardiopathy. And they described a heart muscle disorder leading to heart failure over and above factors that lead to heart failure in the general population. If anybody can find an earlier reference, please ping it to me, because it's, it's something that I'm really interested in. And they also listed in this very early paper a number of potential causes that we're all familiar with today. So hemodynamic factors, abnormal sodium handling, anemia, atheroma, vascular calcification, electrolyte disorders, uremic toxins, dyslipidemia, increased catecholamines, and vitamin D deficiency, PTH, hypercalcemia, et cetera. It was actually about 150 years earlier that Richard Bright, who a lot of us consider the founding father of nephrology in the United Kingdom, spent a large amount of his wealth getting images created of kidneys and of Bright's disease, people with kidney failure. Interestingly, he never got any images drawn of heart disease, but he described two very clear phenotypes. In the top on the left panel, you'll see what we now clearly identify as left ventricular hypertrophy, and at the bottom, a very dilated left ventricle, which we now would know as severe heart failure. Since 1975 to today, we've not come really much further in the cause of uremic cardiomyopathy compared to 1975. We're perhaps a bit clever in how we name things, so we called it increased sympathetic nervous system activity. We now know about FGF 23 and CLOSO, but essentially we're still struggling to understand the, the underlying pathological basis of this condition. But for now, we describe the syndrome as a triad, which is almost totally ubiquitous in end-stage kidney disease, but presents early in CKD, of increased left ventricular mass, left ventricular hypertrophy, diastolic dysfunction initially, so failure of relaxation, followed on by systolic dysfunction, and left ventricular failure, underpinned the whole process by profound myocardial fibrosis. So we take each of these in turn, so left ventricular mass, this is a study by Park et al. from the CRIC database in nearly 3,000 using 3,000 patients with CKD and the 3,000's deliberate emphasis with echocardiography. And they needed this number to show that LV mass increases as GFR diminishes. So the prevalence of left ventricular hypertrophy is common in pre-dialysis, up to 80% of pre-dialysis patients, and pretty much 90% of hemodialysis patients will have evidence of left ventricular hypertrophy. And this increased mass and hypertrophy are associated with atrial arrhythmias, particularly atrial fibrillation, and indeed ventricular arrhythmias, overall mortality, and sudden cardiac death. So this mass is important in dialysis patients and in CKD. What about measuring LV mass by echo? Well, as I've already said, you need good acoustic windows with perpendicular images is a key point. You need to make assumptions of the shape of the left ventricle, usually that it's a prolate ellipsoid, and this works poorly in the face of eccentric hypertrophy, which again is very common in kidney patients. Any mistake in any measurement is, is compounded by the equation where you have to raise things to the power of three, so therefore you cube the error. And the measurements are very susceptible to errors with changes in fluid status, which again is very common, particularly fluid overload in CKD and dialysis patients. L measuring LV mass is where CMR comes into its own. It, you don't need to make assumptions of the model. You don't need good acoustic windows. As long as they can fit in the scanner, you can get a very accurate measurement of left ventricular hypertrophy, of left ventricular mass. This is one of my other research fellows that I think must have done something to annoy us, because we, we got him to study several um, healthy volunteers on a CMR scanner, and then made them re-measure, do the exact same measurements again a year later with nothing being done to the patients. And there were pretty much no differences, but we worked out what the smallest detectable change with 95% confidence intervals is. So left ejection, ejection fraction is 6%, end diastolic volume 13 mils, end systolic volume seven mils. These are tiny numbers. When you look at LV mass, the smallest detectable change is six grams. And this is quite important because anything above six grams we can say is attributable to either change in the patient's condition or as a result of treatment. So this is a quick power calculation for my last successful British Health Foundation grant. 
and looking at studying trans in transplant individuals. And to, to detect a seven gram change in LV mass, all we needed to study was 50 transplanted patients and 25 controls. And this was using CMR. And the argument we made that yes, CMR is expensive, but actually to do the same study in echocardiography would require over 400 patients, um, which is why we, we've been successful so far in getting our CMR studies funded. Not because it's cheap, it's just cheaper than echocardiography. So what about function, left ventricular function? So usually when we talk about left ventricular function, we talk about the ejection fraction. Now, ejection fraction isn't a measure of, of uh, left ventricular contractility. All it is, is a measure of um, ventricular emptying. If you talk about contractile function, you're actually looking at three measures, radial function, longitudinal function, and actually a sp spiraling twist function, which is very much not dissimilar to twisting, trying to get the water out of a towel. Again, the study by Parker down 3000 quick patients using echocardiography shows that diastolic dysfunction, so failure of relaxation is very common and increases with CKD. Systolic dysfunction isn't that common, but again, increases in prevalence with decreasing renal function. And is almost ubiquitous in dialysis patients. So the prevalence of diastolic function is about 70% in CKD stages two to three and over 90% in hemodialysis patients. Diastolic dysfunction associated with left ventricular mass and left ventricular hypertrophy and associated with increased mortality. The prevalence of revert systolic dysfunction, so pump failure, is much less in CKD, only slightly higher than the general population. But in dialysis patients, it's extremely common, 10 to 30%, and that goes hand in hand with increasing mortality from heart failure. The prevalence of subclinical dysfunction is almost ubiquitous. All patients with CKD and end-stage kidney disease will have some measure of left ventricular dysfunction when, if you look at it strongly enough. And this, even the subclinical every dysfunction has a strong association with mortality. If you can measure a regional function using echocardiography, echocardiography, for example, using this is a technique we've often used in the past called spectral tracking. Basically, you divide bits of the myocardium into segments and you see how they move relative to each other, and that's called strain. Or you can see how they move with time, and that's called strain rate. But you, you can see from these pictures, there's a lot of subjectivity in how you draw these circles involved. It's much more elegant in CMR. So what you can do in CMR is you can tag, so this is a feature tracking, you can tag relatively small areas, sections of the myocardium, give them a label and watch them how they move relative to each other. And this gives you very, very, very accurate measures of global longitudinal strain, for example, which is probably the most widely studied measure of left ventricular function. And this kind of deformation imaging strongly associated with mortality and associated with fibrosis which is what we're coming to next. Oops. So this is a very strange study from Japan that I don't think has been repeated in 2005, where they managed to get just over 100 patients on hemodialysis and perform cardiac biopsies on them. And on the left, you see a 56-year-old male on dialysis for seven years with a lot of interstitial fibrosis, and it's the light pink stuff around the myocytes. And this patient died from arrhythmia one year after the biopsy. Very similar patients shown on the right, this time without much fibrosis, who'd also been on dialysis for seven years, but who lived till the end of the study at four years. And in fact, when they did statistics on these patients, if you had more than 30% fibrosis area and you were on dialysis, you were almost certainly, there's a very high chance you're going to be dead after three, after three years of follow-up very powerful predict, predictor of mortality. We can look at um, fibrosis using CMR, using late gadolinium enhancement. This is work from Paddy Mark, also in Glasgow, one of our Eurocam members as well, who unfortunately can't be with us today. And Paddy, back in 2005, published a large number of um, dialysis patients who were being worked for transplantation. And he found two distinct patterns of fibrosis in those patients in the left ventricle. So in the top panel, this is subendocardial fibrosis, very confluent areas. And this is consistent with somebody having had a myocardial infarction. So the area supplied by the arteries is occluded, dies, and that's 
where the gadolinium comes. And I urge you to have a look at this panel A, because I'll show you something very similar later on. So this area that I'm highlighting is an anterior wall infarct. Whereas in the other patients, it was a diffuse process. Just you see the white staining here, uh, which is fibrosis, a diffuse fibrotic process. That happens in pretty much all dialysis patients. Um, the trouble with gadolinium is that it got very bad press for being associated with nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, a very nasty disease that can be fatal. And this is only seen in patients with CKD, usually concomitant inflammation. And in fact, it, it appears to only be found with non-ionic linear chelates of gadolinium. It's, uh, we've never seen it with the microcyclic versions that we all use now. But nevertheless, it, it does make you stop and think when you're going to use gadolinium in somebody with dialysis, particularly if it's only going to be for research purposes. As such, there are other techniques. And this one's called T1 um, um, images, where if you see the white staining here on the left panel coincides with this red staining, which is the same color as the blood, effectively. And that's a high signal, because which we think is fibrosis within the left ventricle. Paddy showed this in, and the team in, in Leicester have shown this in, in dialysis patients. We've actually shown the same thing in CKD stages two to three and four. Compared to controls, they have a T much higher T1 signal and controls and even hypertensive controls with similar left ventricular masses. The T1 state, uh, signal increases with decreasing GFR and is increases with worsening CKD stage. The trouble with T1 is that it's very sensitive to detect myocardial edema, for example, and which but T2, which is using a slightly different technique, is much more specific for water. So there's been some recent elegant studies, which I'm not going to show you, um, which show dialysis patients, when you take a lot of fluid off, the T1 signal decreases slightly, but the T2 signal decreases very, very large. And what we found in our, dialysis, in our CKD patients is that the T2 signal is actually, doesn't associate with T1. So we're pretty convinced this is fibrosis and not edema. So I'm, I'm running behind schedule a bit, so I'm just going to speed up a bit. So valve assessment, echocardiography is still very much a modality of choice. But there is a very much increasing and expanding role of CMR in characterizing the myocardium prior to surgery. So to select the patients for surgery and to select them for the right kind of surgery. For ischemic heart disease, you can do stress testing. So with echocardiography, and you can do that with CMR. It is a lot cheaper with echocardiography. What is a very exciting area is developing rapidly is actually using CMR to assess the coronary arteries directly. So you can actually visualize atheroma and vascular occlusive disease. And I think that's going to be a big thing in the future. The other advantage of CMR, which I haven't alluded to yet, is actually when you're doing a CMR, you, you're also scanning all the other organs in the thorax. And the one that we've been interested in the past has been the aorta. And we can look at the sensibility of the aorta at different segments of the aorta, the ascending, descending, and to some extent the abdominal, and look at how changes in arterial stiffness or distensibility can affect the aorta over time. Right, so this is a quick case study to try and pull this all together. Um, and again, I'd be very interested to see the responses to some of the questions I'm going to ask. So this is a 19-year-old black male with lupus nephritis. He presents with accelerated face hypertension and end-stage kidney disease. And this happens in a district general hospital. So in the UK, hospitals are generally divided into district generals, which serve the local population, and big inner city hospitals, which are also teaching hospitals. So this wasn't at my hospital, it was another one, one of our feeder hospitals. He established on hemodialysis and he has an echocardiogram for transplant listing. And this shows him to have a very impaired ejection fraction of less than 20%. So the nephrologist in this hospital writes me a letter and says, dear Charlie, um, we've got this young guy. His ejection fraction is only 20%. I don't think he's transplantable. I just thought I'd check with you. What do you think? So I'm going to ask you the same question. What would happen if this patient was presented to your hospital? 
what would happen to your transplant unit? One, he wouldn't even be considered because the ejection fraction is less than 20%, and that's too low to put a transplant candidate. Two, you list him regardless of his left ventricular ejection fraction. He's only 19. He's not going to survive long on dialysis. He needs a transplant. Three, would you refer him to general cardiology services for treatment, device therapy, and then reconsider? Or four, would you do anything else? I'm going to give you a bit more time with this question because it might take some thinking. But most of you, a few of you too, would not even consider them. That's perfectly reasonable. I suspect that's what the person referred to them. Some would list them regardless. Okay, again, I couldn't argue with that. But most of you would send for, for a general cardiology opinion, and some of you would other. Those of you that put other, maybe you could put something on the chat or the q and I'd really be fascinated to know what actually goes on in other units, because I do spend a lot of my time pondering this kind of question. So I'll tell you what we did. Um, so we first of all, what we did was we sent him for a cardiopulmonary exercise testing, so a CPEC study. Um, after I'd spoken to the nephrologist in the district general hospital, he told me that he actually had reasonable exercise tolerance. He was walking, doing the shopping, still managing to work a couple of times a day, to, uh, a week, despite being on dialysis. But we needed some objective measure of this. And actually, he had good functional status, and he managed 12.4 minutes on the standard protocol, which was a lot more than we thought he'd do. And there is some evidence from CPEX in post kidney transplantation suggesting that CPEX before, particularly markers like a peak VO2, are good predictors of whether the patient's going to survive or whether they're going to end up ITU. He didn't do too badly. He, uh, in addition to doing the 12.4 minutes of exercise, which remember that the best predictor of actually any exercise test is being actually to do the exercise. His peak VO2 was just above the level that we use as a cutoff in this paper, and the rest were somewhere above and somewhere other. So we didn't think it was unreasonable to proceed. We also didn't think that it was unreasonable to do a cardiac MR study on this patient. Um, for one, because we thought that the echocardiogram, depending on his fluid status, might over underestimate his ejection fraction. As it turns out, it didn't. His, his left ventricle is hardly moving, uh, as you can see in this, in this uh, movie cam. Um, and I think it came back as 21% or something ridiculous, ridiculously low. Because of the importance of this, we actually also gave him gadolinium. So if you've, and if you see here on this, on this left ventricular wall, it's very similar to the pattern that I showed you from Paddy Mark's paper. In all intents and purposes, this man looked like he'd had a massive anterior myocardial infarction. So we had no choice but to proceed to an angiogram. I just let you see the pictures. Now I spend a lot of my time with my cardiology colleagues looking at angiograms they've done in our CKD patients. And this is pristine. This, his vessels look completely normal, which is probably what you'd expect from a 19 year old, but not from somebody who'd had a large anterior MI. So at the moment, we're attributing to all his largely scarred left ventricle to his lupus. He's probably had middle artery uh, inflammation in his, arter in, his, um, in his arteries that's knocked out his left ventricle. So having done all this, knowing he's got good exercise tolerance, good arteries, what we've done is we're going to get him a subcutaneous defibrillator, implantable defibrillator, not because of evidence based in dialysis patients, but in the general population, this low level of ejection fraction together with his massive fibrosis makes him a very high risk of a sudden cardiac death. We wouldn't have considered putting wires into him, but a subcutaneous defibrillator we thought was reasonable. Now that he's had it done, we've listed him for kidney transplantation pending the anesthetist sign off. So I hope I'd have that by today, but it's not just been signed off by the anesthetist. And the hope is that he'll get a good kidney, the potential of live donors, and that once he's established on the kidney, after a few years, it's likely that he might need a heart transplant, and then he can proceed to that. The alternative of condemning a 19-year-old to lifelong dialysis, to a very short lifelong dialysis, we didn't think was reasonable. So to end and try to answer the initial question, I don't think it's a matter of choice between echocardiography and cardiac magnetic resonance imaging. I think it's a matter of choosing the right test at the right time in the right patient. So that's why I've ended with this case, because actually it wasn't just echocardiography and CMR that we ended up doing. 
ended up doing going back to the coronary angiogram or we've ended up going to exercise testing. And of course, I could have shown you his humble ECG that we must do in every patient as well. Just to finish off, I'd like to thank the cardiology colleagues of so Professor Rick Steeds, who's the, my guru, go-to man in terms of cardiac imaging, and Professor John Towner, who's my go-to man in terms of cardiology, and the increasing number of cardiology fellows that we've trained who are now consultants in my own institution and are very helpful whenever I have a cardiology problem. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Charlie. Um, well, I have, we have in the uh, questions and answer, we have two uh, others. That question that you uh, that you post, um, Monique um, said that she will value transplantation for both kidney and heart. So you. Uh, was uh, one of your options, but in the long run, right? Yeah, so he's been presented at uh, several cardiothoracic meetings, particularly cardiac transplant meetings, and he's considered to be too fit. Remember, he did 12.5 minutes of exercise testing. So he doesn't qualify for heart transplant at present. I can't believe that over the next few years, this is not going to deteriorate and he's going to end up needing a heart transplant. Um, in my own institution, we've stopped doing combined heart kidneys. Um, for the simple reason that the kidney often doesn't work. And we've had some disasters. So we would have done, if his heart was bad enough, we would have done a stage procedure of a heart and then followed by probably a live donor transplant two or three months later. Uh, but he's, the, the surgeons won't touch him. He's, he's too, his heart's too good, bizarrely. Too bad for a kidney transplant, probably. Too good for a heart transplant. He, he was caught in a gray area. All right. And the other other um, so says that uh, it will check first whether the patient is at the right tray weight and then perform blood ultrasounds. Yeah, so we did we did exactly that. So we made sure that his parent unit dried him out, and we got him in for a CMR an echocardiogram on his target weight, and did the and it made very little difference. Yes, our presentation that we often see that I do a cardiorenal clinic and I get referred to a lot of patients with the echocardiograms done shortly after presentation when the patient's very, very fluid overloaded. And often you and the myocardiologist just doesn't know what's going on. After you've dried them out and leave them for a few weeks, the ejection fraction often shoots up. So, no, that's a very good point and well made. Uh, Daniel also asked uh, whether after implantation of the defibrillator. Uh, he will undergo another MRI study, or uh, probably not. I, I need to check, but I think the MRI, the the defibrillator itself, will cause problems with the MRI study. Um, it's not. We're not putting in a device. We're not putting in a resynchronization device to improve his ejection fraction. This is purely to stop him having a cardiac death, sudden cardiac death. Assuming that it's going to be a ventricular tachycardia, which again is a, is probably another. Another talk for next year, you can invite me to give. Uh, okay, we have some more questions, but uh, let's first introduce again Olga Balaf and Lucia Del Vecchio, which are here as panelists. And uh, we come back later for the uh, questions uh, related more to the talk. I, I wanted to continue with the, that case, which is, I guess, really interesting and sad, obviously. So, Olga. Good evening from me. Thank you, Jose. Thank you, Charlie, for your nice presentation. You were very precise, as always. Uh, but I have more questions, I think, now. Um, well, in my department, um, we have a CMR, but we cardiologists order CMR for specific cases. We don't use it for clinical, everyday practice for our CKD patients. We do have a regular um, work, um um, echoes for uh, our patients uh, in a regular base for um, they are um, made our cardiologists are very experienced uh, on this uh, area um, there are some facts we cannot neglect uh, as Charlie so does uh, CMR is a magnificent tool uh, it's the only way to get data about the tissue, myocardial tissue. We have more precise information about the function of the heart. And in an old study, 
uh, a vast majority of, I think it was studied in Kidney International, um, a vast majority of uh, hemodialysis patients with left ventricle hypertrophy in ultrasound, they were reclassified when a CMR was performed and um, they were characterized as normal because we know that um, Charlie said so. The cardiac echo overestimates overestimates the uh, hypertrophy of the the left ventricular hypertrophy. Um, but um, for me, it's a bit difficult to because due to its cost to use uh, CMR for everyday clinical practice, and um, we don't have answers to a lot of questions. We don't have longitudinal data, and I suppose Charlie agrees with this. We don't have uh, randomized trials with hard clinical endpoints. Uh, um, so we cannot persuade our hospitals or our stakeholders to have more and more CMRs for our patients. Um, one more comment. Um, I think we have no histological data connecting TAF1 mapping with um, fibrosis had fibrosis. And I don't know if we're going to ever have such kind of data. There's some data in amyloidosis, I think. And um, I would Charlie to comment about the TAF1 mapping. Is it um, a strict protocol? Can every center um, perform such kind of measurements? Is it difficult? What are the pitfalls? Because I, in my mind, gadolinium is the cold standard, and um, I don't know if TAF1 mapping is uh, as accurate as uh, the gadolinium um, uh, images. Well, well, thanks, Olga. There's a very ingenious study ongoing in Leicester, so that's a hospital not too far away, which is also the Cardiology Center of Excellence for CMR study, and it's the kind of study I wish I'd thought of. So what they've done is they've consented a number of patients who are on conservative management. So they're not going to receive dialysis when their kidneys fail. And they're not going to do that because they're frail, they're old, and are going to die in the near future. Sorry, I, I, I sounded very morbid, but it's, it, it's a fact. And what they've done is they are, when they sign a consent form, they've agreed to have a CMR study. They're having a CMR study now, and they've agreed for them to have a post-mortem when they die, and then they will get histological evidence. Uh, I don't think we can do the Japanese study that the Bayoki and stuff. I don't think anybody can ethically justify heart biopsy in dialysis patients. Mm -hmm. um, but no, you're you're absolutely right. A lot of what we do is theoretical. We look at T1 mapping and link, and it seems that images are very similar to gadolinium. And when you do the T1 uh, score against gadolinium enhancement, they correlate very nicely. But we still, I couldn't put my hand in my heart, if you pardon the pun, and say, this is totally fibrosis. It could be extravasated blood. It could be edema. Um, we do, whenever we do T1, we also do T2 mapping, which is a bit more difficult, with the idea that if the T1's up and the T2 is up, a lot of that's probably water. Whereas if the T1 goes up or down and the T2 doesn't change, we think that's probably fibrosis. But I'm choosing my words very carefully, saying think. I don't actually know, as you very elegantly said. Um, to answer your question, um, the technical things are done by my research fellows who talk to me a lot about phantom images. And it is a lot harder than just clicking a button in a machine and a number coming out. It's not like taking a picture with your phone. It needs sequences. It needs somebody to know what they're doing to be reviewing the images as they're brought in. It's tightly protocolized, but it does it is operator dependent to some extent, much less than echocardiography. Um, we've we've set up um, trials, randomized controlled trials using CMR, and we've been the reference laboratory for these studies. And it's never been a problem teaching other units how to do this. And the pictures we get back have generally been a very high quality. Uh, but it does need somebody interested. I, I reiterate, I make it sound simple because as a nephrologist, I don't actually do the test. But it is not like taking a picture with a camera. It does need some skill. 
uh, but nowhere near as much as nowhere near subjective as echocardiography. Okay. Hope that, that answers your two your questions. Yeah. Lucia. Yeah, I am. So first of all, congratulations because uh, your presentation was very, very interesting and uh, it opens to us a, a new world, let's say like this. Uh, in my hospital, uh, magnetic resonance, heart magnetic resonance was, has been closed for a long period because we didn't have a specialized uh, physician to do it and analyze images. And now, starting from two weeks ago, we, uh, the, um, the possibility has come back. And so, and we're starting to do it, uh, uh, heart uh, magnetic resonance to two selected patients, dialysis patients, very, very, very two different interesting cases. And for sure, this possibility open as a possibility to better understand uh, other causes of heart disease. The first patient had very severe uh, left ventricular hypertrophy in uh, a septum, uh, septum of 21 millimeter, a black uh, man, young man with uh, severe uh, hypertension and uh, associated hemorrhagic. And uh, the second case was another very interesting case. A young boy, 18 years old, just started the hemodialysis. We arrived for just my dyspnea and a pro-BMP level is very, very high, 100,000. And uh, he's awaiting uh, magnetic resonance for understand uh, uh, what has caused this marked increase in pro-BMP levels uh, without clear uh, explanation on uh, heart dysfunction. And um, so, what are your opinion in uh, trying to understand the other causes of, uh, let's say, heart disease other than uremic cardiomyopathy? And uh, the second question is, uh, we, we have it now and uh, it's very expensive. Uh, we have one person do it, so we have a long waiting list. So for sure, we cannot do it to everybody. So the question practical is, uh, if you want to start to implement uh, the use of this good exam in clinical practice, from where would you start? Which kind of patient do you elect first to this kind of examination? Gosh, there's a lot to unpack there, Lucia. Um, yes, I, I was interested when you said about the massive left ventricular hypertrophy in your, in your black patient. Um, so, in my hospital, one of the big interests is hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, so HOCUM. And if somebody has an echocardiogram not organized by me or my colleagues, they end up in this hypertensive obstructive cardiomyopathy clinic, having genetic testing, the whole family being scared. Um, and then they get sent to me because somebody wants to transplant list them. And then I spend a lot of time trying to convince them that it's not HOCUM, it's uremic cardiomyopathy. They've got a long history of hypertension, they're on dialysis, they've had CKD for a long time, common things are common. And I, I'm trying to get them listed. My, my aim is always to get as many people on the transplant list as possible, not to deny them. Uh, and battling with the Hocum doctors is, is a constant battle I have. It is good for that kind of thing in a lot of scenarios. So sometimes it, the images, the echocardiography images look funny. They just look weird. And we've detected amyloid, we've detected even a lymphoma once. In a, um, so you, it, it is good to just work out what's going on. And if it is uremic cardiomyopathy or there's something else going on. Um, hopefully I didn't give you the impression that all my patients get a, an MRI scan. Um, we're a massive institute. We've got 1,500 hemodialysis patients, 300 PD patients, and we transplant for a population of 5 million. So... It's a small proportion of my patients that actually get a CMR study, but because it's a small proportion of an extremely large number, it does sound like we do a lot. Um, so a lot of the times, it's like this young man I presented, he's fairly an extreme pitch, uh, end of the spectrum, but we get a lot of people with unexplained heart failure uh, or other features such as left bundle branch block in somebody whose left ventricle looks essentially normal. Um, but we, we try and work out what's going on. The focus, my main focus being to get them active on the transplant list. 
and not and at the same time not waste a valuable resource such as a kidney. That's clinically where I've approached where why where my interest comes in from. In terms of getting the setup as a service, I suspect it's it's a very old-fashioned way. And we started off academically, research-wise, getting my cardiology colleagues interested in kidney disease, get them interested in this concept that they're actually not dying from heart attacks from vascular occlusive disease, which is what most cardiologists want to do. They want to put catheters into people and squirt die and look at the coronary arteries. And if the arteries are normal, they just walk away. They're not interested. It's trying to persuade them that it's actually myocardial disease. And once you get two or three people who are also interested in image, buying into that, then the, the cardiac CMR service available to renal patients ex exploded. I've got no problem getting my patients CMR'd. But that's because I've known Rick and, and John, for example, for the best part of 20 years now. And, and I work very closely to them and do joint clinics with them. So it's about working together. Okay, good point. Yes, definitely. Um, I don't know what your cardiologist looks like, whether you can have a glass of wine with them or not. But well, I that, think we are, we, just, we are just at the very beginning of the road and we are just starting with this uh, new, new interesting cases. So I hope, I hope that it will open a new way of uh, working together for sure. It's, a, it's been one of the things that we've actually been ahead of the Americans. I hope there's not many Americans listening to because um, it's just not been there. They're just not reimbursed for it. So they're not particularly interested. We've had quite a few American companies wanting to test their drugs in small numbers of patients. Uh, approach us and say, would we mind doing a randomized control trial with CMR testing for them? Now, it all went horribly quiet with COVID and Brexit. And nobody's interested in the United Kingdom anymore. Um, but, you know, there was a lot of interest from American companies coming to talk to us about doing this kind of study. Because you need small numbers, but you get a lot of information. Yeah, and bigger rel reliability in changes, for sure. Standardization. Yeah, changes. it's... Um, it's a, it's a joy when writing a grant. The, the numbers you quote are, are tiny. Um, but equally justifying 400 pounds a test is, it can, or 400 euros a test is, is, is a lot of justifying. I think that the really hard question in everyday clinical practice is how do I access my patients for, uh, how do I access cardiologically my patients? How often do I perform the tests? For example, even the ultrasound, how often uh, I talk about asymptomatic patients, not for patients with uh, symptoms or uh, uh, cardiovascular disease. And when, and um, that's what I think Lucy asked, um, which patients should uh, go a bit farther and uh, test something else? And what is this? What is the next step? What is the next, next uh, test am I going to do for my patients? Uh, from my opinion, for example, I think we are overdoing a bit with the ultra, ultrasounds, with echocardio in everyday clinical practice, um, at least in my department. Um, and then what am I, uh, am I going to do? The next year, every two years, every three years, I'm going to have a stress echo? I think that's a hard question. We don't have guidelines for this. No, you're right. Again, if I approach it from my main interest, which is listing people for transplantation, um, this is going to be a plug for my talk at the ERA, where I'm trying to reduce the number of tests we do to get people listed. Um, and we've pretty much said that we do it at baseline when they're listed, and then if there's any change in clinical condition. Um, the only ones we repeat regularly are those with aortic stenosis, because uh, we know aortic stenosis can progress very rapidly in patients on hemodialysis. So we make sure I'm closely linked into our valve surveillance clinic run by, by my cardiology colleagues. And I plug them in and I make sure that every annual, every year, if they're going to remain listed on the transplant list, they have to have a repeat echocardiogram. Um, because I agree with you. I don't think there's any point in doing tests for the sake of tests and to measure things unless you're going to do something active based on the result of that test. The same for ischemia testing. And we've reduced, drastically reduced the number of tests we do. We don't repeat them regularly unless there's been a change in clinical condition. And we've increased the age from 50 to 60 that we routinely uh, test them. And that, coming back to Lucia's questions, how you get cardiologists on board, 
is how I've got my cardiologist and I've stopped them doing the routine things that they think is quite boring and I've got them more into doing more interesting things that we might have to intervene and change practice with. But no, you're, you're right. I think there's a, there's a huge amount of testing done. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of this testing ends up with people not being listed for transplantation like would otherwise would. On the other hand, coming back to the title of the talk, there are people who should be listed. And if you do the right test and show what's actually going on, like the 19 year old, it's one step further forward. So it's not about doing too many tests or too little tests, doing the right test at the right time and the right person. Sorry to keep coming back to that. It's, yes. it's a message I was trying to convey. Good point. Well, I think we have time for a couple of questions more. Um, this one has been repeated a couple of times. Is uh, what are the, the precautions that you had to have with the contrast in the modialysis patients or PD patients? Um, we don't. We use gadolinium very sparingly and only if clinically indicated. So, for example, with this young guy, 19 year old, we thought it was clinically indicated because if we didn't know what was actually going on, he wouldn't be listed and his survival as a 19 year old on dialysis with injection fraction less than 20 was going to be measured in a few years at most. Um, we've never seen it and there's only very few cases of this nephro systemic, um, sorry, my, my mouth's drying up, fibrosis mm -hmm. in the world literature with the cyclic versions of gadolinium. So we don't believe it's an issue, but we still are cautious with it and only using selective patients. There is some concerns about accumulation of gadolinium in, um, in other organs like the brain. Uh, I've never been convinced by that or whether it actually, actually makes any clinical difference, uh, but there is certainly an undercurrent that this might happen. Um, when we do use gadolinium, we just make sure the patient's dialyzed within a few hours, usually the next, the next morning, if it's done in the afternoon. But other than that, we don't take any other precautions. Okay. Um, Andreas Buda asks um, whether you think you, you expect changes in T1 and T2 values uh, after the kidney transplantation. After um, yes, if I remember I showed you Luke's heart scan. He's the research fellow that's doing that study. Um, and I, I wish I'd scanned his brain because it's been very slow in the analysis, but that's the study. There is a small study from Brazil that does show T1 values come down, but not, they don't come particularly on T2. Um, and mass doesn't seem to regress. But I guess the, the whole point of that study was not specifically about transplantation, but it's whether you really cut him up, see, is a reversible condition or not. Because if transplantation doesn't reverse it, I don't think any drug in particular is going to reverse it. Uh, and we should focus on prevention. Um, Hopefully, we'll be reporting on that study any minute now. Abdelhamid uh, asked at the beginning if, whether there is any difference in the echo results if you do it pre or post the modialysis. Oh, huge, huge results. difference. If you do it before dialysis or just before the patients do dialysis uh, with volume overload, the ejection fraction goes down, the left ventricular mass goes up, particularly on echo. Not so much in CMR, but it's still affected by it. Uh, and if you do it straight after dialysis, again, there's a concept of myocardial stunning. We tend to do it on the non dialysis days. Um, and we try and standardize it to the non dialysis day, usually on the Wednesday or Thursday of the week. Great. Uh, Anu asks, what is your approach to monitoring PA pressures in dialysis recipients, especially those with ABF? So pulmonary arterial pressures. Is that PA pressure? PA pressures. Yep. Yeah. Looking for pulmonary hypertension. Um, yes, pulmonary hypertension is one of the, the great challenges because um, most of what we see in dialysis patients, which is labeled moderate to high probability of pulmonary hypertension, is probably fluid overload. Um, so our first step is always to write back to the nephrologist and say, dry your patient out. And when they write back that he's dry, we say, well, try again. And then we repeat the echoes and a large proportion of them settles. In those that we're not sure, again, I approach a friendly cardiologist and get them to do right heart catheters to fully exclude it. Um, but most of the time it's purely fluid. It's not like liver disease where there's a particular pathological, direct pathological relationship with pulmonary hypertension. To my mind, most of it's just fluid. 
and the subjectivity of a lot of these measurements on echocardiography. Um, so again, the, the moderate in our site, mainly because of one of my cardiologists particular interests, we stopped measuring pulmonary pressures indirectly with echo. We actually call it probability of pulmonary hypertension from mild, moderate, severe. All right. Well, I think we need to stop now because there is one minute uh, ahead. Um, I would like to finish asking you all for being here, Charlie, Lucia, and Olga. Um, everybody in the audience, uh, I would like also to invite you, if you're interested in the in cardiology, renal medicine, to join our work, working group, the Eurecam. 